on this episode of Indiana Education Insight. But I just don't think that the current mechanism that we're using to fund all these three different types of school corporations now is going to be sustainable as we move forward, and, and it, obviously it hasn't been. Every week, the Indiana Association of Public School Superintendents is taking you inside today's Indiana education collaboration and tomorrow's education trends. We're staying on the pulse of public school innovators throughout Indiana and beyond. Join our conversation and contribute to our upcoming topics at iapssin.org slash podcast. Here's your host, Dr. J.T. Koopman. Thanks for joining us on today's episode of Indiana Education Insight. I'm Dr. J.T. Koopman. This podcast is being delivered by our IPSS team and produced by Edge Media Studios. As executive director of IPSS, I'm excited to bring you weekly show where we feature Indiana education innovators from all over our great state, from students to superintendents. We'll also be talking to higher education leaders and educators at the state level as we work together as proactive public education advocates. That's why IPSS is here and why we're doing this show. A little bit of background on me, as a lifelong Indiana resident and with my entire educational career in public education as a teacher, assistant principal, principal, assistant superintendent, and superintendent, I'm very passionate about serving the needs of children attending Indiana public schools. I'm also the past president of IPSS and so proud to be bringing you today's show. Every week, we're talking about a trending topic in the public education space while bringing Indiana education innovators to hear from their perspective. As with any organization, it takes great leadership to be successful, and that is one of the main missions of IPSS. It's always great to have experienced and passionate educators joining the show. So let's get today's conversation going. Topics and Trends in Indiana Education. Today's guest is Dr. Terry Gooden, superintendent of Crothersville Community School Corporation and a state representative in District 66. Obviously having the ability to wear two very important hats, Dr. Gooden is a tremendous asset to public education in Indiana. Let's find out how he views the changing landscape in Indiana public schools. Welcome Dr. Gooden. We're absolutely thrilled to have you join us today. Thank you very much, Dr. Koopman, glad to be here. Well, let's, uh, we're just concluding uh, the uh, legislative session, so we're going to talk about that here in just a little bit. Uh, I think our guests would probably be interested in getting to know a little bit about your background and how you got involved in the superintendency as well as being a uh, state representative. All right. Well, I could talk for hours about that, JT. We may not even get to the, to the program here, but uh, of course, uh, state representative down in District 66, and District 66 covers all of Scott County, part of Clark County, and parts of Jefferson County, Madison, and Hanover, and that area. So uh, I became interested in politics, actually, after I became a school superintendent, uh, when I realized how much influence the General Assembly had on our local public schools. And um, I always had the political bug. Uh, My family uh, were uh, Union coal miners down in the hills of Kentucky. So uh, they were always involved politically and always kept track of that. So it just kind of carried over when... uh, when I had that bug and then when I got into the superintendency and had some things going on there in the school corporation and tried to talk to my representative, the bug bit me that, hey, I think we, this public schools need a bigger voice than what we've got there in Indianapolis. Well, we certainly appreciate your presence in the state legislature, and we, we know that you've been tremendously effective uh, in changing some minds on some things that we felt like were important for Indiana public schools. Um, what's different about today's superintendents and why is it important for today's school leaders to understand these changes? Well, you know, there's, there has been a big change in the superintendency and, and specifically as that relates to the General Assembly. As we know, it seems the General Assembly has become much more volatile toward public education. So the superintendent must even be more of an advocate now for public education than they were even in the past. So we've got to make sure as superintendents we get out and let the communities know what's going on in Indianapolis, because honestly, JT, if you're in Southern Indiana, you don't hear about the Indiana legislature. All of our news comes out of Louisville, Kentucky. So as I walk through the elementary school, it's pretty funny. Some of the kids ask me if I've ever seen Governor Bevin or Governor Brashear, the governor of Kentucky. And uh, so I have to laugh and say, no, no, that's that's Kentucky. But and I understand that point. So I think that's why it's even more important, especially for those that live around the border areas of our state, whether that's up in northwest or over toward Ohio. 
to make sure that they see where their the source of their news is coming from so the local constituents there can keep track of what's actually going on in Indianapolis and not in some other state. That's a great point, and I, I think that a lot of our listeners probably don't even realize that, whether it be in uh, – you know, northern Indiana that borders uh, Illinois or Michigan or southern Indiana that, that borders uh, Kentucky. Uh, that is an excellent point and something that we have to keep in mind as we communicate legislative news to our constituents, whether they be superintendents or parents. It really is, JT. And I, I want to uh, make another point about that as we go along, because we all know as superintendents, we've had uh, constituents come to the school board meetings who were upset or they were upset about a specific issue or something going on. And most of the time, if it wasn't involving a teacher or a basketball coach, uh, it was involving some kind of funding or some kind of programming that was going on at the school corporation, which, as you know, is basically dictated by the state of Indiana. So especially on the funding side, uh, my school board, they, they are very great. I've got the best school board in Indiana, but uh, they've been very good and to, to tell those folks if it doesn't involve something that's going on specifically parochially right there in Crothersville that, hey, you're at the wrong board meeting. You need to be talking to your state legislator and at the General Assembly because all of that is dictated by those folks, and we just have to follow the rules. Uh, so that's why it's so important for people to know what's going on. A, a wise school board indeed uh, providing that kind of advice. So uh, we make sure that you communicate that we, that we appreciate that. Um, with the legislature, this uh, 2017 General Assembly just adjourning, uh, much of the conversation centered on roads and infrastructure and education also dominated much of the conversation in, in this session. Uh, so we're here to talk about education. So in, in your opinion, if you wanted to discuss, uh, let's say, the top three to five bills that we saw in this session that affect public schools, uh, can you make any comments about those? You know, I can, JT, and I'll probably have you specifically point out which bills that you think the constituents of the superintendents out there are really the most interested in, and I can elaborate on them. But I think probably, no doubt, the most important bill was the budget bill right? because that's where the funding all comes from, and that's really what dictates everything that goes on in the state of Indiana for the next two years. And as you know, uh, the uh, budget bill is always a compromise between the House and the Senate, and um, this year was a compromise as well. So we can start talking about the funding side of that when we get to that point, whenever you want to jump in. Well, if you want to talk about 1001 right now, let's just start right there. All right. I, you know, I was a little disappointed in the funding uh, mechanism that they use for public schools. Uh, they lower the threshold for the at-risk numbers. Uh, so not as many kids qualify for at-risk. And we all know the, the difficulties in education of, of uh, helping those young people get make it uh, out of the area that the uh, level of poverty or whatever the environment that they're in. So to, to cut the funding to those folks and say that a few more of those folks don't qualify really is almost like a slap in the face to those school corporations who understand the need for those kind of programming that it takes to do that. But now they're going to take that money away from you in, in the special needs side and on the uh, on the at risk side as well. So we all know that sometimes those overlap. And that's why I say special needs as well. Well, with IPSS representing all school districts, uh, suburban, rural and urban, uh, that that was kind of a difficult uh, line for us to walk because we saw in the, the last budget session where they took some complexity dollars away, then those are the dollars that serve those uh, high needs kids that especially schools in, in poverty. And it appeared to me that they did much the same thing this time with the complexity dollars. And so um, I'm also concerned that at the federal level that we're going to be affecting uh, children of poverty when uh, they appear to be talking about uh, cutting the, the title funding. You know, that is a big issue as well, uh, Dr. Koopman, as we talk about the package of school funding. We all know as superintendents that that money's funneled through the state of Indiana, but the federal dollars is really scary as well because we get a lot of federal dollars for those children who are in need at need and especially this obviously and specifically through Title I money. And that's not even uh, counting the Title II grants and the other types of uh, ancillary grants that are out there as well on the side. So the federal side, this is a real big issue and a real big question mark. And right now, uh, from just what we're hearing coming out of D.C., it doesn't necessarily sound like those folks are on our side with that. Well, I, I would agree with that. And, and certainly from the the nature of the conversation about education on the federal side, it, it, it is mirroring the same conversation that we've had in Indiana for quite some time. And uh, 1043 was the pre-K bill, and we were absolutely thrilled with the conversation about getting uh, more dollars for pre-K, but they tied it to vouchers. 
And so if you could comment a little bit about uh, the expansion of, of vouchers in our state, I'd appreciate it. Well, I think there's probably a lot of folks out there that thinks that there should be open vouchers, that any kid should be able to go to school anywhere they want to go. And But it's just not that simple. There's, there's too many uh, parts of the details to make sure that the child gets in the right school, all the things that need to go on in that school and the things that are provided for those children in those schools. So one of those deals where you just can't go anywhere you want to go anytime you want to go. And unfortunately, that seems to be the case right now in Indiana. It's just it's open open door policy, which, hey, open door policy is great. But here's the deal. If the state of Indiana is funding uh, parochial education and also other types of education, then what about the public education side? Because what we've got in Indiana is we've got a pie. And we all know we just came out of Easter holiday and we all know that there's uh, there's one pie there that you specifically like that uh, the fewer the fewer the folks that grab out of that pie, obviously, you're going to have more of that pie. And what's happened in Indiana is, is we're using that same school funding pie, but now we're not just funding the public schools. We're funding the public schools, the public charter schools, and now the parochial or private schools out of that same piece of pie. And so what's happened is, is a lot more people are getting less dollars instead of the other way around as we move forward. So it makes it very difficult, especially in the public arena. Well, with um, I believe the latest uh, number that I'm aware of is about 95% of the student population in the state of Indiana attend public schools. But yet with this uh, past uh, bill that was tied to preschool, we're going to have $167 million now going out in vouchers, and that's a pathway for 13 years if they start that in preschool, pretty much without any boundaries or side side rails to uh, who qualifies for a voucher. Right. And, you know, as, as we move along here, uh, JT, uh, anyone at this point would be, uh, uh, I'm not going to say the term foolish, but I just did. So anyone would be foolish to think that they're going to stop uh, the expansion of vouchers and uh, or basically vouchers and charter schools. But what we've got to do is we got to decide in the state of Indiana what our educational system needs to look like. Uh, and quite honestly, I'm one of those superintendents that says, hey, our educational system uh, is not necessarily broken, but we need to change because we are dealing now with a, a 20th century model in the 21st century, and things just aren't working out like they need to. And there's other ways of doing that. And, and what always baffled me in the conversations there at the state house is there's a certain group that always talks about how the public schools are failing children. They're just doing the, the wrong things. And no matter where they go, a public school, they're failing. But then that same group turns around and replicates the public school model and funds it. So I can never understand the dichotomy there between the conversation, the argument between a public school and a charter or a private who is basically duplicating what the charter schools are, I mean, what the public schools are doing. So that argument, I just could never figure out. And if somebody can figure that out for me, I'd love to hear from them. Let me know how that works. Well, it, there was uh, certainly a point in time uh, in the late 90s when charter schools were designed to be incubators of innovation and that innovation was then to be carried over into the public school. And how we've gotten so far afield from that concept is, is beyond, beyond me uh, because now we have uh, all these private firms that are coming in because they see big dollars that are available to them by uh, a charter school. It is, and, it's, and unfortunately, the, the, the almighty dollar is now controlling the process. And it always has, but in a little bit different fashion. And, you know, you probably, if they're listening here, JT, it probably sounds like that I'm anti-charter school or anti private school or parochial school, and I'm not. I think there's a humongous need in our in our society uh, for the, for different opportunities for children to be taken advantage of. And uh, and I think there's some ways that the state can help those schools make it uh, to try to provide those opportunities and differences. And But I just don't think that the current mechanism that we're using to fund all these three different types of school corporations now is going to be sustainable as we move forward. And, and obviously it hasn't been. Because we talk about how much money is going into education, and they always want to talk about well, every year, you know, this last budget cycle, they, they said we spent more than ever. And this budget cycle, they're going to say one of the rallying cries is we spent more money on education than we've ever done in the history of Indiana. Well, guess what? If you go back and look at the budget, that's been the case for the last 150 years. Every time you spend a little more because the population grows and there's always more needs. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a play on words, and folks really need to understand, wait a minute, okay, but where did you spend that money? Did you spend it at this type of school, this type of school? And as you know, part of uh, my battle cry from the House floor was, and also ways and means, was, hey, look, 
if you're going to give money to different types of schools, at least separate it in line item yep. in the budget so folks can see where this money's going. They don't do that. They want to throw it all into one lump, which, as I said, one pie, and then they divvy it up from there. So if there were three different pies and people saw where the money was going, I think that's probably the best transparency we can have. And unfortunately, right now, they're not being quite as transparent as they really need to be with that. Well, I think the Senate version um, had had the vouchers separated out as a separate line item, and that fell by the wayside pretty quickly um, for a variety of reasons, of which I'm not privy to know. Um, another important bill and something that we've been having conversation about for quite some time are Indiana assessments, and that's 1003. And uh, that went through a lot of iterations as the uh, session progressed. So do you have any comments about our assessment bill? You know, I do. I, I just continue to scratch my head about that, JT. Uh, as we move through the session, of course, last session, uh, we put together a group, 21 educators, business folks, and all this. Uh, hey, you guys come up with the recommendation of what the test needs to look like. Let's do this. We'll, we'll follow your recommendations and finally do something in Indiana that's going to help children. Well, lo and behold, we got there the first week of the, of the legislative session, and the uh, group submitted their uh, ideas and their uh, basically a template for what the test should look like. And I think then the next week that template got thrown in the trash and they did, the, they did their own thing, what they wanted to do. So it was really a waste of money. And probably more important, it took those people that were working on that away from their jobs and other things. So it's a big waste of time for those folks to make those recommendations. I, you know, honestly, if you're not going to use a recommendation, don't put together a committee and go through some kind of little uh, process to make it look like you're trying to, to trying to be transparent. You're trying to do what you think people in the state of Indiana want, because that's not what that's not what happened. And as you know, now with 1003, there's a myriad of more troubles or more problems now that's going to spring up from really, I said this from the House floor and I'll say it here. All you did was change the name from I step to I learn. There's no difference in you, not three hours off the test and that's it. So what we're still going to have is we're still going to have kids going to the bathroom, throwing up before the test. We're going to have kids not being able to sleep at night because they're worried about this test they have to take. Whatever happened to those days when kids enjoyed coming to school and then they wanted to show how much they learned by taking a test? What we've done now is we've kind of turned that whole testing uh, philosophy backwards, and now we penalize children for test taking instead of trying to figure out a way to, to help them move forward in test taking, as you know, and I know I'm not the only educator that's saying that today. Well, I, I basically said that that bill, as, as it came uh, through, it was I-step replaced with I-step. <laughs> that's the best and, way to say it. And, and so it ends up, that's pretty much the, the way that it, that it ended up, and our new state super, superintendent, Dr. Jennifer McCormick, I think uh, created a clear vision about what she saw for the state of Indiana by way of testing. And uh, some of that was paid attention to, much of it was not. And so uh, I just hope that in this latest version of 1003 that uh, it's gonna give the Indiana Department of Education and educators as well as the State Board of Education a little bit more latitude in, in what testing looks like in the state. Well, I hope it will, too. And I know uh, Dr. McCormick, great gal. She's doing a wonderful job. And uh, she listens. She, she's right on top of what's going on. And uh, she came out early and said, wait, you know, wait a minute. Why are you trying to use a test to evaluate teachers? And that's what, as I said earlier, Indiana needs to determine not necessarily what kind of school corporations or systems we want. But we've also got to figure out how we evaluate them. And to use a test to try to evaluate teachers is not the point of why you take a test. Right. You use tests to try to evaluate student learning. And then if, where they're short, then you try to pick that up. You remediate and bring them up to the level they need to be in, not to try to figure out if there's a teacher doing their job in a classroom. That's the principal's responsibility, JT. And that's the local school board's responsibility to determine whether or not a teacher's doing their job. Absolutely. And I think they've done that quite well over the history of our, our public schools in Indiana. The General Assembly is not the statewide school board. And that's what they've been trying to be now for the last uh, eight, 10 years. Right. I, I, I agree with you. And and uh, we saw a little bit of a change in, in that attitude uh, with the revocation of No Child Left Behind and the implementation and the rewriting of that with uh, the Every Student Succeeds Act. And ESSA gave states a lot of latitude to make some changes about how they do education in their state. Uh, any comments about where you see ESSA going? You know, I, I, I was really hopeful and, and thrilled to death when they passed ESSA because it does give states more flexibility. But I don't think the folks that are really uh, in tune in Indiana on the education side, the bureaucracy side, understand what all involves in it. Because we talked about changing the I-STEP test, the I-LEARN step test or whatever. Maybe there's probably a, some kind of a, somewhere in between there we could come up with an acronym for it. I'm sure somebody will. But uh, that, that st basically states as we move forward here, on the testing side, we've got to make sure that we're evaluating students. And that's what the, uh, the, uh, the new uh, federal law states. 
But Indiana is still intent on trying to figure out how to evaluate teachers. And what aggravates me is the simple fact is we went uh, to those bureaucrats in an education committee. And I spoke with one of those individuals and they said, oh, no, you've got to test people. You have to make sure you're testing kids. Yes, you just said the magic word. You've got to make sure you're testing kids, not teachers. We don't need to be testing teachers. So they, there's going to have to be a huge transformation of thought there. And Dr. McCormick uh, took a big stand when she stated that, as I said before, there's no reason why you're using tests to try to evaluate teachers. You just can't do that. And that was a honestly, that was a humongous step for her to be able to go to say that against her, uh, the, the prevailing thought of her party. And uh, I told her that uh, jokingly saw her and I said, hey, uh, uh, superintendent, I said, you're getting ready to get kicked off the team. Be careful. And she <laughs> laughed with me as well. And I was, I was being sarcastic when I said that. But uh, honestly, there's there's some truth in that. And uh, we've got to make sure that the, that what needs to take place is it's coming from that person in that office. That office is the superintendent of public instruction. So we've got to make sure that their voice is heard loud and clear when it comes to education issues. And it hasn't been that way in the last decade. Well, speaking of state superintendent, uh, we also had a bill that uh, – is going to change on uh, make changes on how we uh, have a state superintendent from an elected state superintendent to an appointed state superintendent. Any comments on that? You know, I voted to make it a, an appointed position just from the pragmatic side is uh, the governor is in charge of the state of Indiana and the number one uh, cost of the budget in Indiana's budget is public education. That's about 53, 52, 53 percent of the entire dollars in the budget go to education. So it's probably appropriate that the governor who is in charge of that, of dispensing that, has someone in place that has that shares their philosophy. That way there can't be a, a situation where there's a lot of friction going on. He said, she said, she said, he said, or she said, she said kind of thing happening. The governor will be responsible. And if it's not working out, then there's going to be one person we can turn to to to, to hold them accountable. Right, right. And there certainly there's other models in other states for us to look to to see how that's working. And uh, we just happen to have an elected official, and that's going to be a change, and change is hard for some people. It is. Change is very hard. And I'm one of those Jacksonian, uh, Jack, Jacksonian democracy people where I think the more elected offices you have, the better uh, hold people accountable. But what we've got in Indiana is, is, as I said before, the legislature has became the state school board all the way down into the classroom. So, uh, pragmatically, we're going to have to eliminate that uh, person who just kind of gets stepped on. That would be the public uh, superintendent. We've got to try to bring them in the fold and say, okay, you're going to have to be a part of this policy making decisions now yeah. again. Right. And the only way to do that is with the governor. Right, right. Well, we, we could talk uh, uh, for a long time about many of the bills that were introduced in this session. And unfortunately, we have a limited amount of time and we've covered a couple of key bills uh, in this conversation. Are there any other bills that you want to make a comment on in general? You know, I think really just the overall uh, attitude toward education in the state of Indiana right now, I know that there seems to be an attitude in the, the folks in the field, whether they're a superintendent, a principal, a teacher, a teacher's aide, or even the person that works in the cafeteria, a bus driver feels like that they're being picked on. And you know what? The way it looks, they probably are. But that's in time of need is when that's when people really need to step up. This is not a time when people need to back away and say, oh, well, it's going to be that way. There's nothing we can do because there is something they can do. They have to make sure their voice is heard. They've got to make sure they get to the right people. And for too many years, uh, the state legislators, whether that be a state senator or a state representative like myself, have been overlooked. And as I said before, people come to the local school board and complain. But guess what? Those days are over because that school board is now the Indiana General Assembly. So they've got to make sure that their local legislators know what's going on and how they feel. Well, that's certainly the, the role of, of today's superintendent is communicating with their local legislators and, and being effective and communicating with their boards and communities about those things and how it affects the school district. So I absolutely agree with you. Um, as superintendents, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of that negativity and how it's impacted uh, education in the classroom and the number of teachers that are, that are getting out of education, the number of teachers that are going into the field and the profession. Uh, what kind of recommendations would you have to kind of stem that tide of negativity and, and what can we do as superintendents to help with that? We know uh, as a as a public educator, we are public servants and we've just got to keep that in mind that, hey, we're public servants. So we we serve at the will of the public. We've got to make sure we keep the right attitude as we move forward. And as the old saying goes, this too shall pass. And we're going to get to there's there's light at the end of the tunnel. We're going to get to a better day. And as we move forward, this too shall pass and we will get there. 
And uh, one of the other things that I failed to mention, JT, that needs to be brought out in light is we hear a lot of talk about infrastructure, as you said before in your opening comments, the infrastructure side of that. But one thing that these folks seem to forget about the infrastructure conversation is we, we talk about roads and bridges and all those concrete and all that stuff. But what they continue to fail to mention is the broadband connection. And that is true infrastructure now as we move forward. And there's not going to be a real wholesale change of public education and an opportunity for those schools to succeed until those schools that don't have access to broadband have that access. So I think really the number, one of the number one priorities, JT, is maybe not necessarily paving an extra lane on an interstate, but actually paving the broadband uh, rail so we can make sure that all these school corporations and these children have access to broadband because we talk about rural development. And I was in a uh, rural caucus meeting and uh, the lieutenant governor was there and I said, no disrespect, uh, Lieutenant Governor, I said, uh, uh, but here's the deal. There's no such thing as rural development if they do not have broadband Internet. Right. And she, she agreed with me. So she's going she's gonna to also make that pitch. So we hear about all the horror stories at school corporations where kids getting kicked off the Internet and all of that. So we've got to make sure that the infrastructure is there to be able to build on top of that success as we move forward. And it can't be, there can't be any more success until we get that broadband infrastructure in place. Well, not, not only as a delivery model in, in today's 21st century schools, but also... Uh, if we're going to test online, uh, the availability of that broadband must be there in, in all sections of the state, not just in the highly populated areas. So I absolutely agree with you. There was a bill that, that uh, went through or as part of 1001 actually on, on expanding the funding for broadband and that appeared to uh, really uh, not be expanded too much as far as the number of dollars that are going to be available to schools to to fund uh, their E-rate. Um, why did that happen? You know, I, that's that's what I don't understand, JT. They don't understand the importance of infrastructure in these air, in these rural areas. And uh, it, it is so frustrating to, to be able to talk about, here's what we need in these school corporations. And what is the most frustrating part of that is, is they're expecting all schools to perform at the upper level when they don't even ac have access or the tools to be able to perform at this level. So that's the frustrating part of that. If you're going to be if you're going to be judged and you're going to be um, dictated to on, on what goes on in your school and all of that basically is done via the, the Web. Now, everything's uh, based on the cloud and, and the network. How in the world can anybody perform up to their capabilities if they don't even have the tools to be able to do that? I mean, you wouldn't send a brick mason out to, to build a home with a hammer, you know. I mean, they've, they've got to have the right tools to be able to do their work. And right now, the students in Indiana and a large portion of these schools across the state do not have the right tools to make sure they're able to build on their success. And the most important of that part of that success is the foundation of their success, the early years in, in, in ed, elementary education. Now, that, that is a great point. So uh, in, in closing, uh, do you have any advice that you can provide to current or future education educators and educational leaders in Indiana? You know, I think uh, as we move forward, JT, it's one of those deals where uh, people have to be open to change and we've got to make sure that we're doing the right thing uh, for the for the kids as we move forward. We've got to make sure we're preparing them for a 21st century economy and not just necessarily uh, sending them off somewhere to, to get a job just to be able to stay in one area. We've got to make sure that we expand their horizons and Really, uh, we have a lot of technology and a lot of tools in classrooms, but the most important tool still, uh, JT, I'll tell you, in that classroom is the classroom teacher. And we've got to make sure we support those classroom teachers to give them every, every opportunity they can to make sure they're successful in their classroom. Well, we certainly appreciate your comments today. And uh, I want to thank Dr. Gooden for being our, our guest on IAPSS edition of Indiana Education Insight. Up next, we're featuring a national education online trend that is relevant to our local Indiana institutions. This is a must-pay-attention moment that's right now. A national trend that's impacting Indiana. It's time to bring in our featured panel for Five on Five. Five questions for our experts, five expert answers. Joining us in studio is Joanne Jewett, Chief Accessibility Officer at Site Strategics. We talked last show about website accessibility, what it means, what the law is regarding school district websites. 
Can we go a little bit deeper into that topic again, Joanne? Yes. Uh, I'm glad that we can talk a little bit more about this um, because oftentimes people think that there is some overarching law, you know, something international that guides what we do. And that's not really the case is that most countries have their own set of laws. So we have two specific set of laws here in the United States. Okay. One of them uh, was adopted into law back in 1973 which was the Rehabilitation Act, that actually contains, uh, in particular, this is important for school systems, contains Section 504. So it speaks directly to uh, agencies that receive federal funding. But an additional law is the American Disabilities Act, which came along about 20 years later. Uh, and that act also covers agencies that receive federal funding. That would be Title II, but also Title III uh, agencies that are open to the public so that the public could come in and they would be covered by disability law. Okay. So we have these regulations. Um, is there an enforcement arm that's associated with these regulations? Yes. And in fact, there are two. Um, actually, there are three. But one of the arms, the Access Board, uh, basically is a holding place for these laws. Um, and then you have two agencies, uh, basically the Department of Justice itself, uh, who can step in and enforce the law, but specifically the Office of Civil Rights. That's the office that will most often become engaged in disability complaints. And they can be involved in three different ways. Uh, first of all, they could be involved because there actually is a citizen who launches a complaint and uh, it gets through perhaps uh, a law firm and ends up making it to the OCR. Uh, sometimes the complaint will be lodged directly with the OCR or with the DOJ. Doesn't happen quite as often. But what we're seeing more of, JT, and this is beginning to frighten some of us a little bit, especially in agencies such as schools, uh, where the OCR is actually reaching out itself and is beginning to instigate investigations on its own rather than waiting for people to come in. So I think that's really putting a lot more agencies on notice now. Well, having gone through a, a Title IX uh, investigation <laughs> with uh, OCR, mm -hmm. that's not fun and certainly something that all school districts uh, need to avoid if possible. Right. So are there specific guidelines that ensure adherence uh, to these standards? Yes, there are. Uh, the laws themselves actually are not very specific. Um, so quite some time back, a group called the World Wide Web Consortium, many of us know them as the W3C, uh, decided to step in and to begin creating specific guidelines for developing websites. Um, and many of their guidelines, let me step back and say, those guidelines are much broader than accessibility, but they took on accessibility as well uh, to say that to, in order to meet the law, uh, these are the things you should do in web development. So there are basically 23 different guidelines that they have set up to be followed. Um, and I would say that some federal agencies, such as the VA, for instance, have actually developed a very, very specific set of checklists based on Section 508 um, so that they can ensure that their websites are accessible. Okay. That is great information to know. So who's responsible for seeing that these guidelines are implemented? Anyone who's involved in the development of that website. Uh, so it could be the owner uh, of that. It could be in a school system. Let's just give that as an example. Uh, a school board could be the superintendent. Uh, it could be the CTO. Um, it could be, um, unfortunately, uh, I would hate that this would happen, but it can even be any of those who are developing, including students. So anyone who touches that website could ultimately, ultimately be named in a lawsuit. Well, this is a very complex issue and something that obviously through our IEPSS podcast that we're trying to communicate with the education community about. And fortunately, uh, uh, Aaron Sparks, the uh, CEO and president of uh, Edge Media and Site Strategics is making uh, the trip around the state with us talking about web accessibility and, and informing our members. So we're grateful for that. And I know he's getting a lot of that information from you. 
And he's so fortunate to have you on his team. Thank you. So how does someone that, uh, like myself, if, if necessary, uh, stay current with these regulations and guidelines? Well, uh, you could visit the W3C website. You can actually get on their mailing list and they will help keep you up to date. Uh, they have actually several entities working on several different parts of accessibility development, and they'll be happy to send you all of the updates. You can go to the access board that houses all of these, um, and you can get on their mailing list, and even the Department of Justice has a mailing list you can get on. Uh, and then I would also say come to our website at, at uh, Site Strategics, Accessibility 4.0. Um, get on some other mailing list with accessibility entities, and uh, we'll all work to keep you up to date as well. Joanne, we really appreciate you being with us today. Uh, the insight and the knowledge that you've shared with uh, our audience is, is tremendous, and we really appreciate you being with us today. So thank you, Joanne Jewett, for joining us today. Thank you. Now it's time to wrap up this episode with my take on the current state of affairs in the Indiana education landscape. Dr. JT's closing comments. Unfortunately, in Indiana, it appears that we have a war against public schools and promotion of charter schools and private and parochial schools that are supported by vouchers, which are taxpayer dollars supporting non-public schools. This was highlighted in the 2017 General Assembly with a preschool bill that was tied to a 13-year pathway to vouchers and another bill that gives less accountability to charter schools. IPSS has fought against these issues since they were introduced. But now, Indiana is the leading state in the country offering taxpayer support for non-public schools. It seems counterintuitive since we have clear direction from our founding fathers with separation of church and state. Perhaps we can pursue these issues in another segment of Insight into Indiana Education. On our next show, we welcome the Executive Director of the Indiana Principals Association, Dr. Todd Best. Perhaps Dr. Best can provide some additional insight into the State House and education. We'll discuss that and more on the next Insight into Indiana Education. <music>